Today we're going to be talking about language. Language is usually defined as a collection of arbitrary symbols used for the purposes of communication. Now when I use the word arbitrary, I don't just mean random. What I mean is that the, the symbols don't actually bear any kind of direct relation to the thing that they represent. So for example, when you have the word square, uh, the sounds that make up the word square aren't square-like in themselves. They're not, actually, they're not actually related to the word square directly. So languages are usually described as having two very basic elements, phonemes and morphemes. Now, phonemes can be kind of a confusing concept to grasp at first, but basically what they are is a language's smallest units of sound. But they're not structural. What they are instead is, is mental categories, so they're, they're pretty abstract. So for example, we have a phoneme for the sound t, as in toy, but most of us pronounce the t in toy differently from the t in cotton. Uh, so these two phones, or sounds, are said to be allophones of the same phoneme. So they're kind of like members of one big set. Uh, morphemes, on the other hand, are structural elements. And uh, they're defined as the smallest structural units of a language that carry some kind of meaning. It can be grammatical. It can be semantic. So. Uh, a morpheme can be a really small word, but usually it refers to something that's added onto a word to change it into some way. So we're going to talk about a few common types of morphemes that you might hear about on the test. Uh, free morphemes are words that can function on their own, but can also be used alongside other words. So some examples of free morphemes are something as basic as the word car or the word wash. Now you can use the word car or wash on its own, but you can also combine them to make a new word, which is car wash. Um, so unlike free morphemes, bound morphemes can only appear attached to other morphemes, which you can probably grasp by the word bound. Uh, these typically include prefixes and suffixes. So the prefix on in the word unbelievable is an example of a bound morpheme. A third type of morpheme we're going to talk about is an inflectional morpheme. An inflectional morpheme changes something about the word. So it can be its tense, or if you have a noun, then it can, it can change its amount. So it also usually contains some kind of grammatical information. So for example, adding s to the word fruit makes it plural, just as adding ed to walk changes its tense. So the last kind of morpheme we're going to talk about here is derivational morphemes. These actually change the word itself. In other words, you can derive a new word from the original. So for example, when we add N-E-S-S -S to the word sad, we have a new word, sadness. But unlike free morphemes, ness is not a word in itself, so it can't stand alone. So let's test what you've learned so far. How many phonemes does the word cats have? How many morphemes does it have? You should have been able to guess that cats has four phonemes, or four separate sounds, and two morphemes, cat and the letter S. Do you remember what kind of morpheme the letter S is? Uh, so far, we've talked about two basic elements of a language, phonemes and morphemes. Every language has a particular order in which it strings words together to form sentences. So the body of rules governing this order and sentence structure is known as a language's syntax. Now, sometimes you can confuse syntax with the word grammar, but syntax is actually a subcategory of grammar, and grammar refers to the overall rules governing the use of a language. So an example of syntax would be uh, how in English we usually have a noun followed by a verb, like he writes or they jump. But in some languages, the opposite is true. Sometimes you have a verb first followed by a subject. So uh, the last thing we're going to talk about in this presentation is something that's not related to a language's structure. Uh, this is known as prosody. So you can think of prosody as the elements of a spoken sentence that allow you to hear and understand the intent behind an utterance. So is it a question? Is it a command? Is the person speaking upset? Is he happy? Or maybe he's trying to be sarcastic. So let's, look at, let's take a look at one sentence and see how changing certain elements about the way it's said affects the way you interpret it. Um, I love to eat fried chicken. So if you raise the volume of your pitch at the end of the sentence, you can let your audience know that you're making a declaration. Uh, if you were to say, I love to eat fried chicken, 
you would probably raise your voice at the end of the sentence and perhaps put an extra emphasis on the I so that your, so that your audience knows that you're asking a question. Now, say you wanted to be sarcastic, you might say, oh yeah, I love to eat fried chicken. Again, you're lengthening the O in the word love so that your audience knows that you're being sarcastic. So as you can see, changing the emphasis, raising the pitch at the end, drawing out certain syllables or increasing the volume, all of these things can affect how your sentence comes across to the listener. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about the basic properties of a language. We'll just review a little bit. Uh, phonemes are a language's basic units of sound. Morphemes are its smallest structural units. Syntax is the study of a language's sentence structure, and it's part of the language's overall grammar. And prosody refers to elements such as syllable length, volume, tone, and pitch that allow you to understand the intent behind an utterance.